welcome all our regular viewers, listeners from the Torah Anytime platform, from the Facebook platform, from now the newly uh, joined the Lighthouse uh, Project out from Florida platform. So we thank everybody for joining us. And uh, the idea for tonight is Bezrat Hashem to be a understanding of what we need to prepare ourselves for. Uh, and just a reminder, besides the people that we mentioned before, we're also learning tonight Le'ilu Nishmat Avraham Ben Chaim Yehuda, as well as Yechezkel Ben Avraham. So, the topic is, it's very interesting, when you look at the, the, the shirim, the lectures that are going on now, you have Corona oriented, and you also have a lot of Mashiach oriented. And uh, they're, sometimes they're plugged in together, sometimes they're not. And, I, you know, I thought this is very apropos dur during this time to try to go and, uh, I guess, maybe maybe uncover or try to understand what's the... The goal really is to try to understand what is the final test before Mashiach comes. So everybody is saying, and all the rabbis have been saying this already for, for quite some time, is that we are in the generation right before Mashiach comes. So if we're in the generation right before Mashiach comes, we have to figure out what we have to do to prepare, how should we prepare, what should we do, what should we look out for, so on and so forth. Now, the real goal here is to, to, to go and cover the final test before Mashiach comes. And the reason why this is so important is, picture this scenario, is it was a little boy, and this little boy was obsessed since he was little, he wanted to be a spy. He wanted to work for the CIA, he wanted to work for the government, but not like, CIA by the desk with a bad, you know, like no, he wanted to go undercover, like infiltrate the enemy. He like his dream was to become like the president of the terrorist group, you know, like an infiltrate and bring down the entire corporation. So ever since he was younger, he knew that he had to study well. He had to, you know, he had to be in physical in good physical shape. He had to be intellectually very, you know, like quick on his, on, you know, on his feet. He also knew that he had to know martial arts. So since he was a little kid, he was, he excelled in school. He did exercise every single day. He took karate, kung fu, jujitsu, jiu krav maga, anything. He just like he went all the way. Finally, he finishes high school. He goes and he applies to, you know, to, to the top of the Ivy League colleges and he passes it all with flying colors and now he wants to go and he wants to apply to the CIA. And he applies to the CIA and he's coming in, he comes in with a very, very impressive resume. While he was in college, besides acing everything, he focused on, he specialized knowing how to write and read and speak in different languages. He was fluent in Arabic, he was fluent in Mandarin Chinese, he was fluent in so many different ideas and concepts, really like the top of the line. So, of course, he gets a meeting with the, uh, with, with the recruiter right away. And he comes in over there, the recruiter is amazed, loves him. And he says, you know, come in, we're going to start you on in training. And he is beyond himself. He's going and he's training, he's taking everything, he's taking everything in. But you know, one of those people, not that, you know, they come into the training and there are people that come to the training and they're like sleeping and be like, are we getting paid for this? You know, like one of those people. And then there are people that are like, should we write this down? Someone sneezes and they're like, okay, the, you know, the boss sneezes. Who are we supposed to like? Who are we supposed to make sure that we treat very respectfully because they're the ones who are writing the check? You know those people that are very meticulous and everything? That's what he was. He was so meticulous that while he was studying and training under the CIA, he didn't just study what they told him to study. He went and he studied like everything else. Like what was the clothing issued by the CIA? What type of clothing they required? What type of guns they issued and why they issued that? He went into such detail. He became a Talmid Chacham the Havdil of the CIA and the playbook. And after a long period of training, a long period of testing, a long period of transitions, he finally gets accepted into the CIA. But again, he didn't want to be just an entry level in the CIA. He kept on applying for higher and higher positions. And Long story short, he kept on getting it, he kept on, he kept on succeeding in everything that he was doing. Finally, he came to the final place. This is, was known as the most elite spy group, the most elite group in the CIA. No one even knows about it, that's how elite it is. It's so secret, even the president doesn't know about it. And they go, and people that apply there, 90% don't even get in. And he applies, and everybody's very impressed with him, and he gets in. He gets in, he does this, this training was beyond this training was so difficult that he thought that he would he would be he was going to break he couldn't go and he couldn't uh you know even fathom finishing it he was almost going to quit it but you know what he says i worked so hard let me try a little harder and he kept on pushing himself and he kept on pushing himself and eventually he passed this as well 90 percent of the people that applied did not pass this so he goes in and they tell him your first job 
is we're sending you out to Afghanistan. You have to go and you have to infiltrate Al Qaeda. And he's like, all right, you know, this is what I did. This is what I, you know, I, I'm fluent in Arabic. You know, I'm, I'm ready for this. They go out, him and his team, they go out to Afghanistan and they do surveillance for the first month. And everything is going well. They're in their, you know, si they're in their own situations. No, you know, they didn't approach the enemy yet. And all of a sudden, one day while they're doing surveillance, all of a sudden he hears a little like, like a little sound, then a glass breaks and then he feels like something get like stuck in his neck. And he's like, ah, you know, like with instinct, he takes it and he feels something is there and he quickly pulls it out and he sees it, it's like some sort of dart with, you know, some sort of poison in there. And before he could do anything, he feels himself, you know, passing out. He wakes up and there's a bag, you know, like one of those sackcloths over his head and people are screaming in Arabic. You know, there's a fan like, you know, on the you know, above, there's chains everywhere. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, people, you know, see that he's moving. They take off the sack and they start screaming to him in broken English. We know that you're CIA. We know that you're from the American government. Tell, them, tell us how many people are watching us. Tell us. And they were starting interrogating him and he you know, his training was not to break. And no matter what they tried to do, he would not break. And they tortured him and they beat him and they made him suffer so much. The CIA told him how to, in his mind, how to disassociate the pain from his brain. So he was able to take a lot more than what normal people would take. But then eventually took its toll. And he, you know, blood was dripping down his face. He couldn't see, people are beating him. And finally he's like, you know what? I give up. They kill me. They kill me. They're not. They're not. I, I just can't go like this anymore. And he goes and he says they're about to start again with the torture. And he's like, no, 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 no. Stop, stop. I'll give it in. I'll, I'll tell you what you need to know. And they're all like, oh, okay, finally. And they go and they clean him up. And all of a sudden they wipe off the blood. The, you know, his swelling is like slightly going down. He's able to see. And as he's opening his eyes, he looks down and he notices something very peculiar. He looks down and he sees that the person that's torturing him is, wear, is wearing CIA issued shoes, which is very weird. Why would this person, you know, have it? And he looks around the room, around the room, you know, everything has no association with the CIA whatsoever. But this guy's shoes has the same shoes as what the CIA requires them to wear. And he looks around and he sees that everybody has similar types of shoes. And he's like, what? He's like, how do they have the shoes? And he's like, did they like kill a bunch of CIA agents and then took their shoes? It's like, that doesn't make any sense until he started plugging things in together and he's like wait a minute he says I, I read once that certain groups when they want to send on a really important mission and they know that they have a lot of information what they do is is that they go and they say that you're accepted but then what happens is they're going to test you while you're accepted to see if you're really going to go or you're going to break or you're going to be able to hold strong and keep all the the secrets of the US government to, to yourself and he's like wait a minute he's like maybe this is a test and he looks around, he's like, yeah, this is for sure a test. All of a sudden, when he realized that it was a test, he got this like strength that he was like, you know what, I'm not breaking. And they come in and they start speaking in like broken English with an Arabic accent. They were like, so what are you going to tell us? And then he has to think quick because he realized that he said that he's going to tell them the secrets. He's going to tell them what they wanted to know. So he quickly switches his mind. He starts talking in Mandarin and Chinese to them, like fluently. And they're like, what's going on with this guy? And then he starts acting like a crazy guy and he starts laughing hysterically. And he's like, I'm not telling you anything. You know, and he starts, and all of a sudden he has this boost of confidence that no, and they started torturing him again, but he wouldn't break. He's like, what do you mean? And I know this is my guys. This is my guys. And what made him so comforting is that he knew that these people, even though they're testing him and they're torturing and they're hurting him, he says they knew they're his limit. They're not going to kill him. They're not going to make him injured permanently. They knew what he was capable of and what, where his level is. So he was able to pass the test. And eventually he was right. They came in afterwards and they said this was, this was indeed a test. Now why did I tell you this story? It's so important to know when you, if, if you know that you're getting tested, then you have so much more of a chance of succeeding. If you don't know that you're getting tested, it's going to be very difficult. Maybe you will succeed, maybe you won't. But if you know something is a test, then okay, it's easy. For example, let's say somebody has a particular issue with getting angry and gets angry in the house all the time, screams at everybody, screams at people that are not even there. And then one time they tell them, hey, by the way, we're putting a camera, you know, one of those hovering, you know, um, drones that are just going to follow you along. 
and everybody's going to be watching that. And it's going to be broadcast on, uh, you know, live in internationally. And do you think that he's going to go and he's all of a sudden going to blow up? No, he knows this is a situation where it's sort of like a test to see how he acts in his house. So he's going to go and he is going to act appropriately. So when we know that we're getting tested, we have a chance of survival. And this is why I feel this topic is so important. What are we going to be tested right before Mashiach comes? What is our test? What is our final test going to be? And this works also in our lives, just like everybody in their own personal lives has their tests. And the, the test could depend on many factors. It could be on what sins you did in this, you know, this lifetime, what sins you did in a previous lifetime, what do you have to fix, what do you have to do in a positive sense, what is the purpose of you being in this world. And everybody has their own tests. But imagine two people have similar tests, exactly the same. And they start off exactly the same. And what happens is one person all of a sudden starts working on himself to avoid these tests. Let's use the example of anger. So they're trying to avoid, trying to get rid of all the anger. And it's very difficult, but slowly, slowly they work on themselves. And what's going to happen eventually? Eventually, that anger, it's not going to be so difficult to overcome because you work on yourself. Think about people that never kept Shabbat. In the beginning, it's very difficult, but over time, it becomes very easy and then it becomes very enjoyable. So when you're going and when you realize that you need to work on something, initially, it's going to be hard. But as time goes by, it will be easier. Now, you take these two people with the same exact test, let's say a test of anger, and they're 50 years old. And they started off exactly the same, but one person doesn't get angry, pass the test. The other person still gets angry you know, constantly. What's the difference? The difference is that this person slowly, slowly worked on themselves to the point that the test didn't really become so much of a test anymore. He was, he was, he was there, like he, he was able to like focus and say, you know what, I'm not going to get angry. He didn't let his emotions overtake him. Now, when we think about this, the, the knowledge of knowing what our test is, is so fundamental. In fact, there are many people, think about this aspect for a second. When you go and let's say you have a friend that calls you up and he says, you know, I just spoke to the most amazing, the biggest Kabbalist in the entire world, the biggest of the biggest. He's, you know, like the biggest righteous person. Everybody, this person, he looks at you, he looks into your soul, he knows your past, he knows everything. I just got an appointment to go see him. And he, this is your friend calling you. He says, do you want to come? Do you want to come to this appointment? And you're like, what? Of course I do. This is awesome. He'll, you know, give me a blessing for everything that I want to tell me what I need to do. I, I'm in. You go to this Kabbalist. You sit down in front of this Kabbalist and the Kabbalist, you know, looks at you, doesn't say a word, starts staring at you. And then all of a sudden he starts saying, your likes, your hates, your desires, your character traits, and you're like, like, how do you know, like, all this information? And you're, like, astounded. And then all of a sudden, the capital says, hold on one second. And then he, like, concentrates and focuses, and his eyes are closed. And he keeps his eyes closed for, like, three minutes. And you're like, what is this? What's going on over here? And suddenly, like, you see him concentrating. Suddenly, he opens his eyes, and he looks straight at you. And he goes, and he says... I want to tell you the, the main test that you're here in this world. And you're like, okay, okay. Well, you know, let me write this down. Like, yeah, what, what is it? And he says, your main test in this world is anger. You have to go and you have to fix the test, the, the, the character trait of anger and pride. Now, when this person goes and he goes out, he's like, okay, I have to fix, you know, anger and pride. And he will work on it. He will try and, or she will try to work on this. But imagine... The capitalist goes and says, but, but you have to know something very, very important. You have to work on it right now. If you push this off, you are going to fail. You're not going to be able to pass the test. You have to start working on it right now when the tests are minor. Because once the tests get more severe and bigger, if you don't prepare, if you don't exercise, if you're not able to lift that weight of a test, then you will not be able to pass that test. The same way it works for the generation. There's a test of generation. Every generation has their own test. And there are many rabbis that said that the test of this generation is the, the test of emunah. That's the test of this generation. And in fact, the Rambam, Maimonides, in Yigert Teiman, goes and says, and as well as the Ramchal in Das Tvunos, and as well as Rav Simcha Wasman, what do they say? They say the final test before Mashiach comes is going to be a test on faith, a test on emunah. Now, when we go, and when we focus and we understand there's a concept, there's a test over here of, of faith, then, then we have to go and, and work on it. We can't wait until we get tested and then be like, okay, fine, you know what? I knew this was coming. Now I got to work on it. If you want to succeed in something, you have to prepare for it. And if you don't prepare for it, then you're not going to be able to go and, and succeed and pass. Now I want to break this up 
into three categories. The three categories I want to break this up is part like one, let's call it Mashiach. Part two is, these are all under the umbrella of faith and Munah. Part two is losing belief in God. And part three is bad things happening. And let's start with part one. Part one with Mashiach. Rav Hai Goin goes and he asks a question like this. And he says, when Mashiach comes, we know that there is going to be a war of Gog and Magog. And during that war, Gog is going to have the per permission to go and kill Mashiach ben Yosef. We know that there's two, two Mashiachs, Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef. And our sages tell us, in certain scenarios, depending on how Mashiach will come, different lecture in its entirety on, what, on how we focus and how we understand this, but there's in a certain scenario that Mashiach ben Yosef will, will die in battle. Ask Rav Hai Go and says, why? Why did God give permission to Armilos, which is Gog? Why did he give him permission to have Mashiach ben Yosef go and, and, and get killed? And answers Rav Hai Goen, that is in order to break the heart of those who have no faith. Meaning that people are going to go and they're going to say, we waited for Mashiach for so long. 2,000 years we're waiting since the destruction of the temple. We're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt. And everyone's, we're waiting on Imam every single day for Mashiach. And then what happens? And then Mashiach finally comes. And then what happens? He gets killed. They're like, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm out of here. He says, this must be something is off over here. And what's going to happen? They're going to leave. They're going to leave Judaism. They're going to leave the covenant of, of, of the Jewish nation. Says the Alta of Kelm. Says also in the, in the days of Egypt, the Jewish people were redeemed in the merit of the faith. Now, the redemption of Egypt is a model for the future redemption. And just like the redemption of Egypt, we merited to leave Egypt in merit of our faith, so too in the future redemption, which is the third Bet Amigdash, which is Mashiach, which is the, after the war of Gog and Magog, we're going to merit how? Through the power of Emunah in, in God. Now, there is a crazy, crazy Yalkut Ha'o'im that says something unbelievable. It says something here so hard to understand. Say that in the future, what's going to happen before Mashiach comes, the Jewish nation are going to go to the Arab nation. And they're going to say, the temple is ours. Take the money, take the gold, take the silver, take everything, but leave the temple to us. And the Arabs are going to say, what? We're not leaving. He says, you know what? Let's make a deal. He says, we'll make a sacrifice to God. And you'll make a sacrifice to God. And we will see whichever sacrifice God chooses, that's who is going to be correct, and the other person has to join to the other, to the other group. So the Jewish nation says, fine, let's do that. And they go, and they split up these two kobanot, two sacrifices. The Arabs are sacrificing on one side, and the Jewish nation are sacrificing on the other side. Says the Leal Kut something unbelievable, says, you know what's going to happen? He says, the, the, whose sacrifice is going to go and be accepted? Not the Jewish nation. It's going to be the other side. The other side is going to go and, and that's what's going to be accepted. And they explain because the Satan will prosecute us in front of God. And what happens is, the Arabs are going to see, you see, we're the right religion. You see, we got, there was a fire that came down from heaven and our, our, our sacrifice was accepted and yours was not. You have to join our religion. And the Jewish nation says, no, we're not joining. And there's going to be a battle. A lot of people, unfortunately, are going to die. There's, we're not going to get into it. There, you know, God is going to perform a lot of miracles. The Jewish nation is going to escape. After 45 days of being in the desert, then Mashiach ben, ben David is going to come. Then Eliyahu Navi is going to come. And that's going to enter the era of Mashiach. That's what this Yalkut says. They ask up some Hawasserman. They said, you know, Rabbi, is this really what's going to happen? The Arabs are going to, there's a sacrifice, they're going to be accepted. Is this really what's going to happen? And Rabbi Sibcha Wasserman says, this is exactly the process, but not necessarily the scenario. And he goes and explains the final test will be a test of faith, a test of emunah, a test of faith, seeing that, look, look how it looks like they're right, or it looks like something is wrong over here. The final test will be a, a, a very difficult test of, of emunah, of, of faith. Now, this is a very serious test. If somebody is not aware and somebody is not prepared for this, people could lose it. Because you have to go before, before the test comes, you have to go and you have to prepare yourself for it. You have to go and you have to work on yourself on this. Now, when we go and we look at the idea of Emunah, we could break it down into like two basic concepts. Number one, the, the concept of Emunah, faith, is that there is a God. That, that's a foundation. It has to be there. If not, then what are you having faith in? That's part one. Number Part two is that God sees and controls everything and does everything for the best. I mean, God, ha God has power over everything and He's all good. So we could, we could split it up into these two sections, that there has to be a God, and this God has the power and all-knowing and is all good and, and, and wants only the best for you. Now these are the two factors that I want to speak about in the final two parts of, of, this, of, this, uh, um, of this idea. Now the second part, which I want to focus, is the idea of that there has to be a God. 
And you see nowadays, you have people, uh, the atheistic movement nowadays is unheard of. You know, you're talking about close to a billion people on planet Earth that are that claim themselves to be atheists. It's, it's something that's unprecedented. The, you know, throughout history, people believed always in something. Now you have people that believe in nothing. Says Rabbi Nachman and Breslov in the Sikhas Aran that there is going to be a great disbelief that would grow in the world because of our many sins. And he goes and he says, that, you know, great disbelief. There's going to be a great like confusion that people are going to go and they're not going to believe in the things that they, they ought to believe. And then says Rabbi Nachman and Breslov that praiseworthy are those that hold on to faiths during, during these times. And also we see this in many places. Before Mashiach comes, there's going to be a flood of kfirah, a flood of heresy that's going to descend upon to the world. There's a Mishnah in Sotah, and there's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, page 97a, if you want to look it up, that says that before Mashiach comes, the government will, it will be so much that even the government will turn to kfirah, will turn to heresy. The, the, this is going to be out, you know, all over. It's going to be so prevalent that it's going to be, this is going to be a norm. That's how, that's how scary it is. Now why is this going to happen? Says the Gemara in Sukkah, page 52a. And it says something very interesting. It says when Mashiach comes, right, when, once Mashiach is here, the Satan, the evil inclination, will be slaughtered. It will cease to exist. This is why you can't, if you want to do tshuva, if you want to fix yourself, you can't wait till Mashiach comes. Because once Mashiach comes and the Satan gets slaughtered, it's game over. You can't do anything at that point in time. There's going to be a small, you know, I guess, uh, you know, window of, of like free will, if we could call it that. But there's no, you're not going to be able to do tshuva. Tshuva has to happen before. The Torah's Chaim goes and explains this. He says, what's going to happen over here? If the Satan is going to be destroyed, you know what's going to happen? There's a concept that, that is very well known in the science world and every world that before a power gets extinguished, that it's, it, it, it pushes, it gives off the, the, all its power, all its strength. Think of it like this, that nighttime is the most dark right before dawn, right before it gets light. And that's, you see this also, unfortunately, people are passing away, you know, nowadays, you know, an unprecedented amount of, you know, numbers. And you would, would, if anybody has ever been next to somebody who, you know, as the neshama was leaving the body, what we see is that right before they die, or it could be even a few hours before, all of a sudden it looks like they're getting better. It looks like they're healing. It looks like they're becoming better. And then, on, you know, out of the blue, they just like, they pass away. And this works also with, uh, you know, with a plant. Right before a plant, you know, withers and dies, it will try its hardest to go and produce seeds that it could, you know, and like spit out a seed or whatever it is that they're able to do to be able to go and, and make sure that the plant is able to go and reproduce, you know, again. So, explains the Torah's Chaim that the evil inclination is going to die and it knows that it's going to die. So what happens before it dies? It gives all its power, all its energy, right before it dies, it gives like a burst of energy. And the Satan before Mashiach comes is going to give a burst of energy to try to go and overcome and, and, and break people down in sin with whatever power that he has left. This is why the Gemara in, uh, in Sanhedrin, in page 97a, goes and says that before Mashiach comes, there is going to be an extra level of chutzpah, brazenness in the world. They, and we see that the young people, the Gemara says, will be arrogant and disrespectful and will shame the elder people. And you see over here, like, the, the, the sins that will be before Mashiach comes is something that's, you know, not the normal, not what's, you know, not what, what, what your psychology, what the way that the world should intently, you know, work. The idea over here is that the Satan is going to work so hard so hard before Mashiach comes that what? That it will try to make you go and sin in any way that it can. And the Chidusha we can say over here, it's not only in the, in, in the sins of let's say chutzpah, it's going to go on anything. And that's what we see over here, sins that unfortunately people are going that everybody always had sins throughout the, the entire, you know, generations. Always, sins always existed. But we see over here in, in a in a, such a different fashion than, any, than anywhere else. Never, never else in history did we have technology that we could use for bad, as we are trying to do today, or for, you know, we, for good, I'm sorry, that we're trying to do for good today, or you could use it for bad. And we all know how that could work. And there's so many, so many tests that we have nowadays that people before didn't have these types of tests. And the Satan is like literally trying, trying, trying to go and, and destroy him. Now what happens when someone gets these types of tests? And what happens? Many people fall in, during these tests. But what ha there's two options that you could do when you fall. You could either go and decide, you know what, I'm getting up, I'm fixing myself. Yes, I fell down. Yes, I did this. In, but you know what? Now I'm fixing myself. I'm not going to do this anymore. You do tshuva and then you move on. But however, there are other people that don't go that way. There's an interesting pasuk in Dvarim, chapter 31, verse 17, that says that many evils will fall upon a certain person. And what, you know what this person's going to say? or these group of people are going to say, says, you know why these things are happening? Because God is no longer in my midst. That's why, that's why these problems are happening. And the Chachamim, our sages, go and elaborate and explain 
that what happens is what man goes, distances himself from God, and he does a sin. And he sinks lower and lower and lower. But now he has a, he has a question of what he's going to do. Is he going to do tshuva and he come back? Or he's going to go and make himself that the sin that he did was not really a sin. The concept over here is a very common concept that I speak about. Often it's called cognitive dissonance. Meaning that when you do something bad, you don't like to be considered a bad person. So you don't, you're going to try to convince yourself that it really wasn't so bad, or you will amend the bad that you did. Those are basically the two options that you have. That either you're going to fix the bad, and then you're not bad anymore, or you're not going to say that it's not bad what you did, and then hence you're not bad anymore also. So what happens is, so either you do the tshuva, or you're going to convince yourself that it wasn't bad. And how do you convince yourself that it wasn't bad? It's very simple. You say that the Torah doesn't exist. You say that God doesn't exist. Atheism all of a sudden is getting so popular. You know why? The Satan is working so hard. And the Satan is working so hard, so people are feeling guilty. It doesn't have to be this religion. All religions. There's things that they're supposed to do, they're allowed to do, and there's things that they're not allowed to do. So when they do something they're not allowed to do, either they could say, I could fix myself, or they're like, you know what, I kind of like doing that stuff. And I don't want to fix myself. I want to keep on doing this. So you know what, I don't want to be a bad person. So it's very simple. Now, all of a sudden, there's no God. There's no religion. There's no higher power. So I could do whatever I want. So I'm not bad anymore. And this doesn't have to be that someone committed a major sin and he has this epiphany now he has to throw away God. Even if someone didn't do a major sin, and all they do is they want to live their life a certain way without any, uh, you know, restrictions without any they're able to do whatever they want then even before doing any sin they would be able to go and bring up this process and convince themselves that there isn't a god there isn't a religion there isn't anything and then do whatever it is that they want now what's interesting with this in mind people when they're doing research or whatever they're 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 looking into people often come to conclusions not because they're intellectually honest with themselves but because they wanted to come to that conclusion. I'm going to give you an example of dating. This is uh, something that I deal with. So you have people that are going and let's say they're dating a particular person. Now there are certain times where you could tell like they want this person to be the one or the, or on the flip side they don't want this person to be the one. And it could be, let's say we use an example, let's say looks or money, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Let's say uh, a person's going out and this there's something in this character trait or whatever it is in this person that they really like and they want this to be the one. So they'll go and they'll try to make sure that everything, even if it's a red flag, even if it's something that's problematic, they'll try to go and try to say that, you know what, it's really not a problem. It's really not a problem. And they'll go to so far extent, you know, you know, imagine, uh, you know, a girl goes out with a guy with a tremendous amount of money and everything else with him is like, uh, you know, like at best. And uh, she's like, you know what? But he's really good, he's really kind. And then one of her friends was like, you know, I, you know, I was watching you guys, you know, when you were on the date. Didn't he push that old woman down the stairs? And, the, you know, the girls would be like, well, you don't understand. Like, he was really taking care of me. Like, he wanted to make more space for me. You know, make some crazy excuses. Be like, he's really good. You know, because that's, they want their answer to be that he's really good. And it's really good for me. And this really is the one. On the flip side, you have someone that goes, they decide they're going to go date with a, on a girl and they come out and this girl looks like, you know, Trinosaurus Rex and they're like, you know, like, it's not going to happen. And, but they can't just say it's not going to happen. And you go and you, you know, I speak to them and be like, so what's going on? What's the problem? You know, they sneeze like five times in a row. Nobody can live with that. You know what that is? Like sneeze, sneeze. You're like, you go out of your mind. And you could tell by the way that people answer certain things if they want it to happen or if they don't want it to happen. So if they want it to happen, they'll start giving excuses for everything bad that it's really good. And if they don't want it to happen, they'll make any excuse to make it bad. Now, this is like when you're going into something, you're automatically going to be biased in it. And the same thing when you're going into religion. And in fact, I'll give you another example. Um, it, there's, there's two law schools. In the University of Virginia, University of Baltimore, they have this, um, this it's called the Innocent Project Clinic. This is a, a this is the, what the firm does is they go and they identify individuals that have been convicted of crimes that they did not commit. So they relook at these cases. So what happens is what the first thing that they do, they explain, is that they give back to the, to this, to this criminal or the defendant or whatever it is you want to call them, the presumption of innocence which is, by the way, supposed to happen the first time around. The presumption of innocence means that a person is innocent until proven guilty. But the problem is, they explain, is that when 
and, and they even say that no one in the profession really believes that this happens, that they have the presumption of innocence. People automatically are biased by the way that they look, by the way that they dress, by the way that's why the lawyers go and they prep them. You have to dress nice, you have to go do certain things, you have to act in a certain way, especially in the courtroom, so that the jury sees you act a certain way. And they go and, 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 you know, and they say, what happens when jury sees a person sitting already you know, behind the, the defense table? They're going to say, like, he got here somehow. He must have done something wrong. So already, before they even figure out or find out what the crime that was committed, they already look at this person as guilty. So they're already biased even before they even realize what they did. And this is obviously not considered innocent until proven guilty. This is already guilty, and now let's see if we can prove him innocent or vice versa. So the way that it works, and when, you, when I speak to people about, like, God, so some are honestly looking, they're intellectually honest, and when they see the overwhelming proofs of it, they get it, and they say, you know what, I see it. But others, it's very interesting, others, you could tell that they're not interested. It's like, you know, they dated this girl that looks like Chinosaurus Rex, and they're like, you know what, I'm not interested. So even though everything is great about her, they'll make any excuse possible to make it that it's not really the right one for them. And one of the interesting things is, is that the, the, the focus where it comes from is, is like science. They, you know, I'm speaking to these type of people, they have such a passion about science. I'm science is a god for many people. I, I, without a doubt, I feel that very strongly that some people, science is a god. And it's very interesting that if they have something that the Torah says, and then they have something that science says, and it doesn't, it doesn't seem to match up, automatically the Torah, it must be wrong. Not science. God, no, science, we, we buy that. Science, oh, science, it's unbelievable. Science, you know, but Torah must be wrong. And when I was speaking to one person about that, I was speaking to somebody recently, and I was like, oh, why? Why would you say that science is so on a high level? We know something very, very obvious. Science has always been changing. It's always been evolving because we're learning new things. Always. The Torah has never been changing. The Torah has always stayed constant. So when you have something that's variable and you have something that's constant, which one are you going to look at when something is wrong that you have to, maybe something is going on over here? And I gave them an example as this. I said, the, the, you know, in 19, NASA has this on their website. In the year 1919, the, um, the science world came out that the age of the universe is infinite. And then in 1929, just 10 years later, they say that the age of the universe is 2 billion years old. And by the way, when science says something, they say this is what it is. They don't say, we, most of the time, but they don't say, we, uh, we kind of think this is what it is. No, they say this is what it is according to technology, according to science, this, and they're confident. And if you don't believe in this, then you're not listening to science and your, your mind is not working well and you're not looking at facts. They love throwing out the word facts. Yeah, you're not looking at facts. And I'm like, okay, so let's look at this. So 1919, the age of the universe, for a fact, was infinite. 1929, for a fact, it changed two billion years. 1955, it changed the age of the universe to six billion years. 1965, it now was a range, 10 to 25 billion years. In 1993, which is not that long ago, the age of the universe was anywhere between 12 and 20, 20 billion years old. In 2006, now the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years old. And if you go and you say that the age of the universe is not that, then you're not looking at facts. And the question is why? How is this a fact of every 20 years or every 15 years, it changes to something else? So when you have something over here that is constantly changing, why are you focusing only on the changing aspect? You should focus on the constant. You focus on the Torah. The Torah is not changing. The Torah always stays the same. And the answer is, is because you want this to be right. You're coming into the picture biased. You're coming into the picture, I want this to be correct. I want the science to be right, and I don't want to believe in the Torah. I don't want to believe in all that. So that, how could you go? The real problem is, is that you can't convince somebody who doesn't want to listen. You can't talk to somebody that doesn't want to hear anything else. The, when Mashiach comes, the Gemara Sotah, top, page 49b, the Gemara Sotah Hadlin also says that we mentioned before, chutzpah is going to increase. Chutzpah is arrogance. You know what? People are going to have such confidence, if I could even call it arrogance, in science, that if science tells them that there's no God, then they'll say, you know what? There's no God. They have such arrogance in, the, in, in this, in this, the chutzpah that they have, that even though their parents were religious, doesn't matter what religion we're talking about right now, even though the parents were religious, all of a sudden they decide they know better than everything else, because what? Because science told them. Even though science is constantly changing, even though science is constantly changing what it, what it thinks and what it is, and what it, it's, it's unbelievable how people, and, and it's fascinating because I'm looking at it from a little bit of an outside perspective when people are talking to me. So when people are talking to me, either by the, it, it works on anything, by the way. It's on dating, on business advice, on, on anything that people want, they automat they're already lean towards one way. And they have this, and you could tell when you pick up different, you know, the, the, the different verbiage that they use when they're talking, when they're asking, you could see which way they're leaning towards something. So when they're coming, they already want a certain answer to happen. 
And this is going to be the test before Mashiach comes. The test is going to be, are you going to be honest with yourself? Or are you going to go and you can convince yourself of what you want to be true? Are you going to go and say, listen, if bad things are happening, maybe I should do tshuva, maybe I should do something, or are you going to say, you know what, no. You know what, this is a scientific you know, explanation for this and it has nothing to do with anything else, and you're going to go and you're going to convince yourself whatever it is that you want to convince yourself. Because before Mashiach comes, it's going to be a test of faith. And if we don't see a test of faith now, I don't know what you call it. Because this is a, you see this on all angles, on everything from the way that people run their business, from the way that people raise their children, from the way that people speak to their spouses and treat their spouses. They have a... They, they, you know, Emunah and Bitachon has such a foundation on every single aspect of their life. There's so much that we need to learn about this. There's so much that we need to implement about this that we could see that the, the, the Satan is working whoo, over time on full force now. That concludes the second part. Let's go to the third part. And the third part is bad things. Now, why, do, why is this included? Because let's say you have people that they say, you know what? Okay, I see that the Torah is true. I see that there could be a God. Or even if you don't say that, but they say, but what about the Holocaust? How could there be a God if there was a Holocaust? There's a very famous scientist, which I'm not going to name, uh, that, that the reason that this scientist doesn't believe in God is because how could there be so much problems and issues in the world and there be a God? Now, and it's very interesting because the reason that this scientist says that there's no God is not because of scientific proof or anything like that. He's going more on a philosophical thought process. And he's saying, no, 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 you know what the reason is? The reason is, is because there can't be a God because if God is all good, then how could God allow so many people to die? And that's really what I want to focus on in the third and final part over here. The Ramchal in Das Tvunos goes and says something very interesting. It says that the generation before Mashiach comes, the primary test is going to be with things that seem to be contradictions. There's going to be like in, in the way that God governs the world. They're going to see, look at this, Tzadik Veralo. You're going to see a righteous person that he's suffering. He says, well, I don't understand. And you see a Rasha, a wicked person that is doing very well. And people are going to watch good people suffer. And how are they going to go and say, like, how could there be a God? Says the Ramchal, says the test is going to be when people see this and they're going to still remain loyal and faithful to God. Now, in general, most people consider themselves good people. I've spoken to people who have done some, like, serious, like, no-nos in, like, any way you look at it, not even religion, in, like, ethical. They did really, and, like, do you consider yourself a good person? And they're like, you know, I've done some wrong in my life, but yeah, overall, I am a good person, yeah. People generally consider, them, they say, okay, I have to grow and I have to gain, but overall, I'm a good, decent person. Some people even go to the extent that I'm a tzaddik, and if somebody wants a blessing, uh, you know, of course, you know, like I just gave a quarter and a half to charity, of course, I'm, <laughs> come on. You know, I sat in a class while paying Candy Crush, uh, <laughs> you know how righteous I am right now? So they go and they convince themselves that they're either good or on the, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, completely righteous. Now, what happens when a bad thing happens to this person who thinks that they're good? They're going to say, like, oh, I don't get it. Why do bad things happen to good people? I'm a good person. Why is bad things happening? So they all of a sudden, these thoughts come to the mind. They're going to start getting angry. Wait a minute. How could there be a God? How could there be all this thing? They're going to start getting angry. This is, what, this is what it's supposed to I keep Shabbat. I keep kosher. This is what I get. How could it be? People ask questions all the time. Like, how could it be that I started keeping Shabbat? I started keeping kosher. I started keeping modesty. And my friend didn't do any of that. She's married with kids and has a husband that apparently loves her. And I don't have any of that. And they say, why? Why is all these, all these questions? And of course, you know, the questions that keep on coming back again and again, like you look at righteous people and how they have it so bad, which means is not only the question is on me, now the question is also on other people. How come that other people are so righteous? How can it be the Holocaust? So many righteous people go and pass away. Says the Rambam, Maimonides, in Igera Teman. He says that now, as our exile becomes lengthy, many troubles will come upon us. And many, says the Rambam, will leave the religion. But, says the Rambam, some will have no doubts and will not be confused. And the Rambam, Maimonides, goes on and says that all the troubles in the end of days are trials. They are tests of belief and truth. That's what the test is going to be at the end of days. And the Rambam says something very important. He says you have to make sure that you teach it to the children and the women. And if I could add also, of course, the men. That, the question, that they have to realize that any question of belief and emunah that they have should be answered. They should be answered to, they should know without a doubt that God loves each and every single one of us. And God takes care of us and everything that God does for us is for the best, even though we don't see it right now. This is what Shlomo Melech says in Kohelet, chapter 8, verse 14. Shlomo Melech goes and says, Yesh tzadikim, you see righteous people, Hashem agia alem ki rashaim. You see righteous people, that they look as if they were wicked, as if they had deeds of wicked. Why is God punishing them as if they were wicked? 
And the answer is in the Ishayahu, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. Says God, God answers, says, Ki lo machshavotai machshavotachem. My thought process is not your thought process. Velo dakechem daka. Your ways of doing something is not my ways. I don't work. People try to understand God's calculations. And they, if they can't understand God's calculation, must be He doesn't exist. Or He doesn't, like they don't understand it. God says, what? You can't understand something that's not in your, in, in your ability to understand. To, to give you an example like this, is that let's say somebody goes and wants to look at coronavirus under a microscope. So if they're looking at a microscope that doesn't have the power to magnify, because coronavirus is extremely small, it's 120 nanometers, nanometers in diameter, it's very, very small. And it, by the way, to tell you how small it is, when you're looking at the you know, very common pictures that are floating around of the coronavirus, those are magnified 12 million times. That's how much you magnify it. So if you're using one of those, I don't know, college, uh, you know, you know, microscopes, you're not going to be able to see the coronavirus, the general ones. You have to magnify it so many times. So imagine someone goes, gives you a little dish and says, I want you to check to see if there's coronavirus in here. And you go and you put it under the microscope, but your microscope is not strong enough. But you don't know that. And you're looking under this microscope and you're like, no, there's no, there's no coronavirus in here. Are you right? You're 100% wrong. There is coronavirus there. You're just using the wrong, the wrong materials, the wrong utensils to go and see it. And the same thing is you have people that go and they try to understand God. How do you, it says in Isaiah, it says in Isaiah, you can't, you can't comprehend something that's beyond your comprehension. You're looking at it a microscope that doesn't have the ability to go and magnify all these times. We don't know the calculations. We don't know why things happen. But one thing we do know. And what, what, how are we going to go and explain this? Moshe Rabbeinu asked this question to God in Shemot, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. Moshe Rabbeinu goes over to God, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he says, Hareni na'at kodecha, show me your glory. You know what Moshe Rabbeinu was asking God? Moshe Rabbeinu was asking God, I don't understand. How could there be righteous people that have it bad and wicked people that have it good? Please explain it to me. You know what God answered him? Lo tuchal lerot et panai. You're not going to be able to see my face. Because nobody will see my face and live. The question is, how does that answer the question? And the, the Pasuk goes on. The, the Chumash goes on in verse 23 over there. It says God, but it says, et But you'll see the back, the back of me. So what, how do you understand this? Explains the Chassam Sofel. says something so beautiful. Sometimes we wonder why God does certain things. Why God brings so much suffering upon the world. But what happens is, is after some time elapses and we look back in hindsight, then we are able to see that all the difficulties were really of something that was something that turned out to be something great. You look at the example, let's say Miguelat Estel. Vashti was killed. And then what happened? A good from modest Jewish girl, Estel, gets pulled into the wicked Ahasuerus and gets, you know, sucked into being the queen. Now, she didn't want it. She didn't ask for this. And you look at it, people are going to ask, what did she do to deserve that? She was so modest. She was such a righteous person. Why did she do to go and deserve to be punished in such a way, to be a wife of such a wicked, you know, king? And what happens? You wait a little bit. And all of a sudden, when you look at the end of the story of Purim, of all of a sudden, Miguel Atestel, everything makes sense. As you know why? It looks so bad. It looks so bad. Why is such a good Jewish girl getting so much punishment? And the answer is, it's not bad. Relax. Wait a little bit. Once you see the end of the story, be like, what? You know what? She saved the entire Jewish nation. All of a sudden, it became not bad, but it became amazing. It became good. There's a story that Rabbi Azriel Tauber brings down that one time he was flying out from <coughs> Israel. He was going out to give. Uh, he was flying out to give a lecture in um, outside of Israel, and he gets to the airport. And it turns out that the flight was delayed for a crazy amount of hours. And everybody, all of a sudden, started getting you know. And you, when the flight gets delayed about 35 seconds, people are like, "Come on, you know." People get angry. How could this be? You know, I paid this with good points. You know, whatever it is that you come, you say, "I paid good money for this." How could you go and not leave? People get so angry. And everybody was going, running to the ticket counter, "Get me another flight." How could it be delayed? And there was one person. That just sat in the corner, opened up a sefer, opened up a holy book, and started learning from it. That was Rabbi Israel Tauber. And all of a sudden, he's learning, and he's focusing. Everybody's screaming. People start coming down. There was a Jewish professor that was also on the flight. He goes over to the rabbi, and he says, um, Rabbi, I don't understand. I was looking at everybody, and including myself. Every single person here started getting angry at the ticket person. They started getting angry at the airline. So I get, why? We got to go. We have a business meeting. We have this. We have that. How can you delay us for so long? We got to leave. And I see you're the only one that sat calm, happy, sitting and learning. He says, how do you do that? 
So he goes and explains, he says, listen, he says the Torah teaches that God has full control of everything. And this too, somehow is for the best. And the rabbi goes and says that he, was, he went and he missed the lecture. He missed the lecture. He wasn't able to give the lecture because of time, because of the delay. And then he goes and he wondered, he always wondered, like, why did God do that? Like, what good can possibly come out of that? He was going to go fly out. He was going to go inspire a group of hundreds of hundreds of people. Why did God make it that he would go and he would miss his flight and he would go and he would be delayed that he wouldn't be able to make that, uh, that event? And he didn't know. Fifteen years later, there's a person that walks up to him, has a kippah, has a long beard, and he goes over and he says, Rabbi Tauber, do you know who I am? And the rabbi says, I'm sorry, no, I don't. And he goes and he says, 15 years ago, I met you at an airport. And I saw that you didn't get angry when everybody else got angry. And I asked you why. And you said, this is the way the Torah teaches, that we know that everything that God does is for the best. And he goes and he says, you know, that inspired such a spark in me. He says, you know what, I'm Jewish. He says, I don't feel that way. And it inspired in him, you know what, let me go and look more into this. And I said, I started doing research and I started learning and I became a full Baal Shuvah. And he says, now I go and I learn. Says the rabbi, he says, you know, for 15 years, I always wondered what would be the good that came out of this. He says, now in hindsight, I see the good that came out that I missed a flight and I missed a whole lecture of hundreds of, of inspiring hundreds of people so that I see that one person became 100% religious from that event. We don't always see the full picture. But over time, in our lives even, we could look back and be like, you know what, we thought that was really bad. But you know what, it kind of worked out for us for the benefit. And we look at this also, when Moshe Rabbeinu approached Paro, and he goes and he says, let the Jewish people out, let the Jewish people go. You know, Paro says, oh, the Jewish people, they have their, on their minds to go and dream about vacations, to get out of here. Let me increase the workload. And he went and he increased the workload. And Moshe Rabbeinu goes over to God, in and we see this in Shemot, in Exodus, chapter 5, verse 22, and it says, Lama lama Why have you harmed these people? I came, says Moshe Rabbeinu, to go and save them. And instead of saving them, that made it worse for them? He says, God, why did you do that? Why did you go and why did you do that? And he goes on, the pasuk goes on, and, and, and God goes over to Moshe Rabbeinu, and says, you know, I, I appeared to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. They did not question my, action, my actions, but you're questioning my actions? Ask Rav Yaakov Naiman in Darkei Musa. He goes and he says, I don't understand, what, what, what is God saying over here? When you're dealing with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, yes, God told them certain things and they went and they suffered in certain situations and they never questioned God. He says, but it's very different in Moshe's scenario than in Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. In Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, they were dealing with their own person or maybe their family to the largest extent. Moshe Rabbeinu is dealing with the whole nation. He's not, in fact, if Moshe Rabbeinu didn't go and cry to God, that would be, why didn't you go and cry to God? You should have done it. So as Rabbi Yaakov Naim, says, what was, the, what was the claim against Moshe Rabbeinu? He should have cried. And the answer is, the problem was not that he cried out to God. The problem is the phraseology that he used. Moshe Rabbeinu used, Lama Eretha Lama Zeh. Why did you cause bad? Why did you cause harm to this nation? God says, I never cause harm. He says, not only it wasn't bad, but in the end, it appeared to be that that difficulty was the source of salvation. We know that the Jewish nation was supposed to be enslaved for 400 years. But they were only enslaved for 210 years. We just finished Pesach, and what did, the, what did we say in the Haggadah? Shahakadosh Baruch Hu Chishevet HaKetz. HaKadosh Baruch Hu went and he calculated the end. What did he mean he calculated the end? Haket, the, the word Ketz is the numerical value of 190. The Jewish people were supposed to stay for 400 years. But what did God do? God wanted to make the end come earlier because He knew the Jewish people wouldn't be able to, do, to, to, to last. So He took 190 years off the 400. When you take 400, you remove 190 years, what are you left with? 210 years, exactly the amount of time that the Jewish nation spent in the, in the land of Egypt as slaves. Now, we see over here something very interesting. That how, did God, what, how was God doing this? That God made it that their workload would increase, so it would be as if they fulfilled the quota that they needed to fulfill in 400 years. So when it looked bad that they were stuck in Egypt, and they were going, and Moshe Rabbeinu came, and he was supposed to save them, and, and he made it worse for them, that really difficulties really went for their best. And this is what happens, something very interesting when Mashiach comes. When Mashiach comes, says the, says the Pasuk in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. It says, Bayom ahu Hashem echad echad. He says, on that day, God will be one. The question is, wait a minute, on that day, God is one today also. God is one all the time. God is never not one. God is always one. So what does it mean, Bayom ahu, on that day? And the answer is that sometimes we look at the way that God deals with us and be like, you know what, now God is dealing with us lovingly, compassionately, He's giving us good. And sometimes He treats us you know, harshly and unfairly. That's how we look at it. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. 
The answer is not. In the future, do you know what's going to happen? He's, we're going to see how he will oh, he's always was, is, and will always be dealing with us kindly and mercifully. In the, in the future, it's going to be so clear that everything is, is for our best. That's what it says, Bayom Ahu, and that day, that day we'll see that everything that happened was really through mercy and it was really for our benefit. There was a story that was told of a man that was boarding his flight and he was very hungry and he went and he bought a box of cookies. And he put it in his bag, he goes down, he's you know, had a crazy you know, day, he's exhausted, he's starving, he sits down and he goes down and he sits down and he's relaxing a little bit and he says, you know what, he calms himself down, let me eat something. He goes into the bag and he opens a box and he starts eating his cookies, makes a bacha, he starts eating the cookies. And all of a sudden he sees the guy next to him, put his hand into his bag, take a cookie out and eat a cookie. And the guy's like, you okay? He's like, what, are you serious? The guy just went into my bag and ate my, the chutzpah that this guy has. And he says, you know what, you know, people don't like confrontation, not going to say anything. He goes in, takes his cookie, takes a cookie and starts eating it. And he sees, a few seconds later, the other guy takes a hand in his bag and eats a cookie. And this guy's like, you have got to be kidding me. The people nowadays, and he's like, he's boiling up in there. Now he's, now all of a sudden he was exhausted, he has energy, now he's angry. And he's like, you know what, he puts his hand in, in back in there, eats another cookie. He sees the other guy, puts his hand in the back, eat another cookie. He is like, you have got to be kidding me over here. <laughs> he's like, you know, laughing hysterically, like, you know, like, oh, you know, like saying words to himself. And all of a sudden he goes and he reaches down, and he takes a cookie and he sees there's one cookie left. He goes and he sees the other guy, reach his hand into the bag, take the cookie, break it in half, put one back and eat the half of the cookie. And the guy says, you're unbelievable. He reaches in, takes the final cookie, eats it, doesn't say a word. He says, you know what, I can't deal with this right now. Relaxes, finishes, he drinks his water and then he, he boards on the plane. As he's sitting on the plane, he's putting his luggage away. And as he's putting his luggage away, he opens up one of his bags and he looks inside and he's like, he sees over there, he's like, there's a box of cookies. And he looks in and he takes a box of cookies out and he sees it's completely full. And all of a sudden it hit him. He was so discombobulated that he reached into the other guy's bag and he was taking the other guy's cookie. So meanwhile, he was getting so upset at the other guy, but in essence, really, he was just taking the other guy's cookie. Sometimes we see that God is taking things away from us. It looks like God is just taking, but there's going to be a one day, Bayoma, who one day will realize that in truth, God only gives, 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 gives. Bayoma, who Hashem echad And until that day comes, there's Alachan and Shulchan Aruch. In Noah Chaim, it says, Kol ma David Everything that God does, God does for the best. The Chavot HaLavavot goes and brings down a story also that there was a group of travelers that went to sleep against the wall. And as they were sleeping against the wall, what they, there was like a stray dog that came up and walked up to one guy, picked up his leg and sort of marked, the dog marked his territory on this guy's face. And the guy like wakes up with like, you know, let's call it water, splashing in his face. And he's like, what? He's like spitting it. He's like gagging. And he's like, you have got to be kidding me. He's like, why do bad things happen to good people? I'm like, so good. He goes and he runs out and he goes to the nearest like water source and he starts like washing his face. He's like, God, why? I'm exhausted. I want to sleep. And you got to get out of all the people. I, he has to go do his business on me. And he's like, I, why? And all of a sudden, as he's walking his way back to go in his little spot near the wall, he sees that the wall suddenly caves down like with a sudden crash and goes right on top of all these people. And all of a sudden, he's like, you know what, God? Uh, yeah, thank you for sending this dog uh, you know, to do his business because this saved my life. Rabbi Cheska Levinston goes and says, in Parashat Beshalach, see this in Shemot, chapter 15, verse 25, what does God do with the bitter waters? The Jewish people had bitter waters they weren't able to drink. He tells Moshe Rabbeinu, throw a piece of bitter wood into them and that's going to make it sweet. Says the Ramban, Nachmanides, he says that God taught Moshe the ways of Hashem. He says, you know what? You know how God works? God makes bitter things sweet through bitterness. And there's something crazy. The Ramchal and Das Tfunas goes and says there's a rule that the situation that causes agony are the catalyst for the good that we later receive in our lives. And this is what one time Rabbi Echazka Levinson was writing a letter of condolence to a certain person. And he says that when a person goes through hard times, this should cause a person tremendous amount of happiness. Because this is a sign that something good is surely on its way. And this is how we have to go and we have to look. Now I want to share with you one final thought before we open up to questions. Something that is so important that when I learned this, it just blew my mind. The way that is the way that the Chafetz Chaim explained something. And the question that it goes is as follows. 
you have people that are, they get angry at God. They're like, God, I, I try so hard. I, you know, I'm such a good person. I pray, I go and I, I do the mitzvot and I go and I give charity. I do all these things and they keep on complaining. Like, why do I have such bad luck? They go and they complain. The, the, their luck, the mazal doesn't seem to be shining on them. The Chavetz Chaim explains something so beautiful with this mashat, with this parable. He goes and he says, a person goes through life and unfortunately he commits many sins, many averot. But comes Yom Kippur, he goes and he asks for forgiveness. And what happens? God forgives him. Atones, he atones for his sins. But what does that work? That works between sins with that son, between you and God. But between you, a sin between you and your friend, you have to go and appease the person. You have to go and ask for forgiveness from the person. And if you didn't ask forgiveness of the person, Yom Kippur is not going to erase that. You have to go and physically go and ask the person for forgiveness. But what happens? If this person didn't ask for forgiveness, then that person has to come back in this world as a Gilgul in reincarnation and go and atone and fix that, that issue that he left off in the previous life. So imagine, says the Chafetz Chaim, this person passed away, was Nisa. And he gets up to Bed Din Shalmala, he goes up to the heavenly court and he sees his whole life passing in front of him. Nothing was forgotten, they see every detail. And they see, and he goes and he sees all the terrible sins that he did. He's like, oh no, what's going to be? Uh, but then Bet Din goes and shows him that he's praying on Yom Kippur with such sincerity. He's crying, he's asking God for forgiveness. And Bet Din announces, God forgives you for all these sins, all these sins. And he has, when you're, you know, getting judged, you have like a, you know, there's a jury. And that jury is your family and your friends. And everybody's cheering, they're so happy. You know, you got vindicated from the things that you are going to get punished for. They're so happy. But then all of a sudden, there is this black angel. A huge monstrosity of an angel comes up and he says, wait a minute. He says, this person got into a fight with his neighbor and he insulted him and this neighbor ne never forgave him. Now this person has to go back down to this world and ask for forgiveness again. And when this person starts hearing that he has to come back to this world, he starts crying, he starts begging, he's so, he has so much regret. He's like, I'm so sorry for what I've done. Like, I, please don't let me go back down there. He doesn't want to. And they say, I'm sorry, but there's no other option. We have to, we have to send you back down. And he goes and says, you know what? When you sent me back down last time, you made me rich. And I was extremely rich and that, that brought with me arrogance. He says, if only I was born into a poor family, then I would have been humble and I would have never gotten into such a quarrel with my neighbor and I never would have gone and, and, and hurt and insulted him that type of way. So he goes and he, says, and he, goes and he pleads in front of, of Bethany and says, please, this time, please make me sure that, that, that I'm going to be poor, I'm going to be humble and give me some sort of deformity. He was going and says, make me, you know what he was asking for? He says, make me suffer so that I shouldn't be arrogant, says the Chafetz Chaim. This, this person is going and begging, begging the Bethany Shalmala. And the Bethany says, I'm sorry, we can't make you poor. We can't make you as, uh, you know, as with a deformity, because then it's not going to be the same test. Your tshuva won't be an honest tshuva. Your tshuva has to be exactly the same. You're, you have to be in the same scenario. So he goes and he pleads with them, says, please, I'm begging you. And all of a sudden, while he's pleading and begging, there's a white angel that comes in. And the angel says, look at how much merits this guy has. This guy has so many merits. He's done so much good with his money. And because of this angel, the Bethany decided they're going to request his, his, they're going to accept his request. And in the end, he's born into a life of poverty and suffering and deformity. Then goes the Chafetz Chaim. He says, you know, people go and they complain about the bad that they have in their life, about what they are forced to suffer during their lifetime. Says the Chafetz Chaim, who knows? Who knows you're, what you're complaining about? It could be that before you came down into this world, you begged God for this. You begged God to give you this test. You begged God to put you in a situation that's difficult because you knew that you had a certain test that you need to pass. And the only way that you're going to pass it is if you would have been born in a situation that is difficult for you. That you have to be born in a situation where you are raised secular or you are born in a situation where you are more angry or you're born in a situation where you didn't make the panasa that you wanted to or whatever it is that you have, you're not married yet. No matter what it is, you don't know. It could be that you begged for this. And we go and we pray for God for so many Yeshua. We pray God for so many things. And God is not answering us. And you're saying, God, why are you not answering me? And God's saying, I am answering you. You don't know the full picture. You begged for this in the, in the world above. And now I'm giving that to you. We don't know the full picture. And when we go and we lose faith, we lose emunah, we lose the bitachon because it seems that God is not answering our tefillot or it seems that God is not listening to us or it seems that God hates us, that is completely incorrect. This is going to be the test before Mashiach comes. It's going to be a test of emunah. People, unfortunately, are going through so, many suff so much suffering now, so many problems that we have. But the question is, how are you going to deal with those problems? Are you going to have a munah bitachon and realize that there's a loving God, there's a loving creator that created you and put you in a certain situation, not only to, for your benefit, but also knowing that you have the ability to go and pass this test. This 
is the final test and the final generation. There's going to be so many questions that we have, whether it be from a Shiach, that we're going to look that things are just doesn't make sense, it doesn't seem right. Are you going to go and you work on yourself on Yamuna? Are you going to fix yourself? Are you going to work on yourself earlier to know that when the bad things happen, you're going to go and you're going to be able to overcome it? Or whether it's going to be all this science that gets thrown to your head that goes and they say it's not really true, this is not really true, the Torah is not true, or whatever it is that they throw, even though it's easily proven that it's incorrect, are you going to be swayed to that side? Or are you going to go hold strong with Emuna? Are you going to have all these questions when you see bad things happen to you or bad things happen to people that are, that are good people or close to you? Are you going to say, how could there be such a God? Or are you going to say, you know what? I don't understand. I'm looking through a microscope that I can't comprehend. I don't see the full magnification of what's going on over here. And when we come to that realization, then we realize something very, very important. We realize that things are not as clear-cut as we see them. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. And we have this test coming up, written, and not only coming up, it is right now, and it will be. People ask me all the time why I speak so much about atheism, why I constantly you know, bring this up. And the answer is because this is a huge test right now. And to be honest, may Mashiach come you know, now. And, but in the unfortunate event that it doesn't, I foresee this being a bigger issue. I foresee this being a bigger issue and I'm trying to get in front of it. This is something that we have to figure out. We have to go and we have to train our children to show them that God is real. We have to show them that Torah is real and it can be proven. And not only that, we have to go in and instill it into ourselves and realizing that everything that happens, everything that happens is for the best. We instill this and when we realize that this is a test that we have to pass and this is a test that we have to deal with, now we have the opportunity to go and to figure out, are we going to work on it? And when we work in it, we'll have a chance of passing it. Or we're going to say, you know what, I'll deal with it later and may God have mercy on us if we could pass it or not. My blessing I give to each and every single one of you is that Bezat Hashem will be able to not only overcome this, the test will be so easy that it wouldn't even be, we're at such a high level that God doesn't have to send us any suffering that we have to pass. It's God doesn't have to send us any difficulty. And Bezat Hashem will bring the Mashiach from the good and we won't have to see any of the suffering anymore. We'll now open up to any questions. Okay, so we have, over here, I have to look at these, uh, it's so funny, I have to like read now, I have to like zoom in over here. All right, um, questions, questions, uh, no questions, just comments. Okay, doesn't revealing all these things, oh, okay, so here we have a question. Question is, is, doesn't revealing all these things kind of ruin the point of the test? So that's a good question. The question is that, now that we know that this is a test, so now it kind of ruined the test. It's like when your teacher goes and says, hey, by the way, um, focus on number three in your homework sheet because you're going to get tested on that. Like, okay, it comes to defeat the purpose of the, you know, of the test. So the answer is yes and no. The answer is, is that, when you go and you get a test from your, I don't know, from your teacher and they tell you, focus over here, if you're not going to focus on that, then with all due respect, you're an idiot. You know, like, obviously focus on that. That's what she or he told you to focus on. And if you don't, then there's something wrong with you. So it's sort of like giving you a, you know, an area of like where you're going to go and you're going to get, uh, you know, uh, test it on. But the truth is, we, if we look into ourselves, we can really go and realize where we got tested in every aspect of our life. And the, the, uh, the Kabbalists tell us that when things are difficult in your life, if let's say somebody has difficulty with stinginess, a person should, should know that that is that person's test. If a person is, has difficulty with uh, dressing modestly, then that, you should know that's your test. That the things that are difficult for you, the more difficult it is, the more of a greater of a test it is for you. And that is what your focus in this world. And if somebody wants to know what's their main test in this world, if they look into themselves, what is the hardest thing for you to do? That is your main test. So in essence, this is, this is not really saying something that's like cheating. If you look into, your, into yourself, you'll be able to see this. But then there's a test for the person, but then there's a test for the generation. The test for the generation, the rabbis tell us, the final test. Now, by the way, I want to be very clear. It doesn't mean that you're not, there's not going to be any other tests. Just like yourself, for your own personal you know, tests in your own life, you have a test, let's say your major test, let's say anger, but you have a bunch of other, minute, you know, other tests. But it doesn't mean that all, the other that, you know, that all the other tests doesn't count. You only have to focus on the anger. You have to focus on everything. And the same thing, the final test with Emuna. Unfortunately, there are going to be other tests. Every single one of us has their own test. But the question is, the final test, the main test for the entire generation, that's a test of emuna. Okay. Uh, share a thought. Okay, over here. Okay, so here is a thought. Um, I heard a description of Chevle Mashiach. Imagine a rope that we're holding on and the rope will keep 
will get will keep on getting shaken the test which is a test of una and we need to hold on tight during each shake of the rope and the answer is 100% correct um, I mentioned this previously also as well that uh, this um, the, the, the idea over here is is that the the let me just explain what the comment was is when we go and we come to before the time of Mashiach, it's known as Chevle Mashiach. Chevle is also in Hebrew, whoever speaks Hebrew is like a rope, like a Chevel, it's a rope. And what happens with a rope? Why is it Chevle Mashiach? Because a rope, imagine somebody has to go and cross this like this bridge, and this is a bridge of a rope. And this rope, they're standing on the rope, and let's say they're standing on a rope, and they're holding on another rope for their balance. Now, what, imagine someone's holding on the rope and now they start shaking the rope from the, from the other side. So all of a sudden they're, they're shaking back and forth. The entire, the entire bridge is shaking. So if you hold on to the rope, then you have the ability to go and stay on the bridge. But if you're going to think you're cool and you're going to let go of the rope, then you'll just fly right off. Chavle Mashiach, before Mashiach comes, the rope of Mashiach is going to be is going to be tested. What is the rope? The rope is emunah. The question is, are you going to grab hold onto the rope? Are you going to grab onto God? Are you going to grab onto the Torah? Are you going to grab onto emunah? If you grab onto emunah, then you have a chance of passing that bridge and getting over to the other side with Mashiach. But if not, unfortunately, um, let's not finish that sentence. Okay. Any other questions? Because I got all the questions from the comments, I believe. Any other questions that anybody has from the Zoom? You could unmute yourself. I don't think I could. I don't know. I don't think I have to do something. No questions? So oh, if yeah. If anybody wants to uh, ask a question, you can go ahead and under the reactions, raise your, uh, there's like a hand uh, suggestion there. Uh, and then that way we can uh, go ahead and unmute you. That's cool. I never know you could do that. I was wondering, I got a question. Yeah. First of all, amazing, amazing lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when... Mashiach is, is going to come, uh, um, or before Mashiach is going to come, are we uh, going to have Gog and Magog? Are we already in Gog and Magog? So, so that's an excellent question. The question is, is where are we vis-a-vis -vis the Gog and Magog war? Um, and the answer is really that we don't know the full extent of how it will go. And I'll explain it like this. So, the rabbis um, told us, I believe it was the Chafetz Chaim, who said like this, said that Gog and Magog is going to be a three-part war. And the first part of it is going to be during World War I. The second part of it is going to be in World War II. And the third part will be in the final, right before Mashiach comes, where some people call it World War III, but however it is, you go and you interpret it. So there is, there is a concept that the, the, war, the Gog and Magog did start, and we're in the process. There is also different ideas and how we go and we interpret it that before... There's a few Midrashim that I speak about before Mashiach comes. Devel Gadol Bala Olam means that there's going to be a great plague that comes into the world. And that's how some people are interpreting, you know, the coronavirus. It's great, it really is a great plague throughout the entire world. And that's also part of the process. But there's something very interesting that I want to point out, very important from the Rambam, Maimonides. And Rambam says like this, he says that when we look at all these concepts and predictions and understandings of what Gog and Magog is going to be, how Mashiach is going to be. He says that we have to look at this with an understanding that we don't really know how it will all finally play out until Mashiach comes. And then what happens is when Mashiach comes, we look in hindsight and we'll see how everything plugged in perfectly to how the sages said it. Because there's always different ways of interpreting it. And I'll give you an example like this, that the way that Mashiach could come could either be, um, either, either it could be Achishana, it could be, uh, it could be brought very earlier, or Be'ita in its time. And the, the, the Gemara goes and explains this as follows. The, the Mashiach come either early or in its time. So if it comes early, how does Mashiach come early? Mashiach comes early if the Jewish nation goes and follows the Torah, follows the mitzvot, keeps the Shabbat, keeps everything that they're supposed to do. So we bring the Mashiach early because of the good deeds and the merits that we have. However, if we go and we don't do that and we don't collectively go and bring Mashiach in this, in this, in this sense, then what's going to be is, is that Mashiach is going to come when it's the final time, meaning that it's going to be at a time where God's going to be, you know, like, that's it. It's, it's game over now. Mashiach has to come because it's the end, of, the end of time. So what's going to be the difference over here? The difference over here is going to be very, very important. If Mashiach comes early, there's going to be so much less suffering. There's, the Gog and Magog is not going to be, from what we understand, the severity of it. It's going to be so much less suffering. It's going to be miraculous. It's going to be amazing. It's going to come through the good. If it comes to the final time, then unfortunately it comes with Gog and Magog. It comes with, with severity. And this is also how people go and explain the death of Mashiach ben Yosef. Mashiach ben Yosef doesn't necessarily have to die. But if it comes in the bad, then it's more likely that he will die in a battle. But with, you know, with battle of Gog. So it all depends on how we come. And so there's so many different variables over here. There are the, the, the sages 
decided that yes, we began the process. But where we are and how much we are ahead, let's hope there is, I forgot which, if I'm not mistaken, there was, I think maybe it was Rabbi Khan Wasserman, but don't quote me, I think it was him, that said that the majority of Gog and Magog was in World War II. Was was during he was he passed away in the Holocaust. Uh, you know he's murdered. Uh, you know the, from the Nazis. Um, you know may God have you know avenge his, his blood. But uh, th he mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, he mentioned that um, that the majority of Gog and Magog was during that time. Okay. okay? All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay. Any other question? Oh, here's a question from the side over here. Will Mashiach build the third temple? So the the answer is is that is there's there's different opinions on how the third temple would be built. There is a there's actually three interpretations. The, one interpretation is that will be built, you know, over here from Mashiach. Like the Mashiach will go and build it. Um, the question is is going to come before or after. There's different interpretations of that as well. Or there is and uh, there is a you know there's a, uh, an interpretation that Mashiach that the, the temple will actually descend from heaven, and then. This is the most common interpretation, is that the, the people will physically build a temple over here, but then there's going to be a spiritual counterpart that will come down from heaven. So it sort of combined those two interpretations that they're really uh, one interpretation. So it, it also depends, you know, there's different interpretations. This is something that we will see once Mashiach comes. Any other questions? Hi, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know what does it mean Mashiach comes like is it like a baby that has been born already and he's just kind of in the world or like what does that mean Mashiach so that's a good question. So what does it mean that Mashiach comes? And I think your question is also focused more on what, is, you know, like who is Mashiach or, or like how is Mashiach, like the, the concept of that. And the answer is that Mashiach is a, a normal human being. Doesn't, it's not raised from the dead or whatever it is that people are interpreting it in different religions. Mashiach is a regular human being and, uh, and, and every generation there is a Mashiach. So when that machine, and by the way, it's very interesting. If I'm not mistaken, I think it was the Chassam Sofer who says that just like Moses, when Moshe Rabbeinu went, and he was, if I'm not mistaken, he was 80 years old when he, when God told him that you're going to go and you're going to, you're going to be the redeemer of the Jewish nation. Now, in his previous 80 years, he didn't know that he was going to be the redeemer of the Jewish. He only knew right when the mission mission came, and it says the Chassam Sofer just like that. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So. Just like, I don't know if you guys could hear that, but let me see if I can exit out over here. Okay, so just like the, you know, the times of Moshe Rabbeinu, Mashiach himself, which was, the thing about the Redeemer, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know that he was the Redeemer, so in the future also, Mashiach is going to be a very righteous person, but he doesn't know that he's going to be Mashiach until the time comes. Until the time comes, he's going to be extremely, extremely righteous, and then in the way of, through prophecy, it will be revealed that he is, uh, that he is uh, Mashiach. And if that person, you know, and, and then obviously when that person passes away, there's somebody else that takes the place. So there's always a Mashiach ready to come. So we can't say, you know what, Mashiach is just an infant, um, which unfortunately there's a religion that says, you know, like you know, baby JC, they pray to it. It, it, it. it doesn't work that way. There's always Mashiach ready to come. If, God, if, if we go and we show God that we're worthy, Mashiach comes right now. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. That, that clarifies it a lot. Okay. Just to follow up on that question, what, is, what does it mean by there's a Mashiach in every generation? Like, uh, is there really like somebody, I, I know there's a lot of righteous people in every generation, but there's really a Mashiach in every generation? So maybe if I phrase it this way, it'll be clearer. There's somebody worthy in every generation of be, being Mashiach. Ah, okay. And yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so we have here some questions over here. Um, how do we do? How do we do tshuva if we don't remember all the people that we may have hurt or insulted over the years, or if we never knew that we hurt them? Why do people say that Mashiach cannot come on Shabbat? Okay, so these are very, very uh, good questions. Um, the the aspect of tshuva is a very, very you know, um, you know, it, it's true. It's difficult that if somebody goes, if somebody was, let's say, uh, and I'm not speaking to you. I don't know if this was. Oh, this is privately. So no one knows who this is. I'm not saying like you know, some people were like really bad and they hurt a lot of people. They're like, what are we supposed to do? So. In, in each situation, I would say you have to speak to a rabbi on what particularly you do in a certain scenario. Because they have sometimes, um, so I deal with a certain group of people that, I don't know why, but they tend to do a lot of, uh, not tend, they used to, before they realized the Torah, before they, realized, before they became religious, uh, tend to do some sort of in, what we call, uh, you know, insurance, uh, then it starts with an F. 
uh, insurance, uh, you know, I'll just say insurance fraud. And they came and said, you know, like, really, it's not bad. They, how are we supposed to go and how are we supposed to pay back and how are we supposed to do certain scenarios? So there are certain times where you're not really able to do, like, how do you do it, Chuba? The real way is, yeah, send the money back or whatever, you know, there's different scenarios you're supposed to do it. But let's say you don't know what you've done, you know, you don't know who you've heard, you don't know how many people you've heard. So you really have to boil it down. You, you, you can't technically do like a blanket chuba, but really when you're dealing with people, you have to do, it's personal, because if you hurt somebody, you have to go and appease them. If that person is not, so in every scenario, it has to be dealt with. For example, if somebody is no longer alive, then there's a way to still ask forgiveness by the grave. If somebody is also, or you could pay back to the, you know, if it was money related to the inheritance, whatever, there's different scenarios that you could go through it. If you come to a situation where you have no idea how to pay back, or you have no idea how to appease, then you have to speak to a rabbi, and there's certain things that you can do, um, especially if, let's say somebody you know stole money from let's say a government so then they start some sort of you know program or something they give money towards something to helping the be the public so there's different scenarios that you're able to go and you're able to uh, benefit the public and you're able to do a certain type of chuva but ultimately the best level is obviously fixing what you uh, what you messed up okay well, we got a bunch of more questions over here um, oh this is a hard do we have do we have the ability to change our personal test through tshuva in this life, even if we ask Hashem for that specific thing? That is a fantastic question. I, I got to tell you that question. That's a fantastic question. Oh, that was really good. Are we, and uh, maybe I'm reading it something. Question, sorry, can you repeat it, please? Yeah, I'm going to repeat the question. The question is like this. Do we have the ability to change our test in our life? Let's say through tshuva, or maybe, you know, even to the extent that we asked God for that specific thing. And I'm going to give you the answer, and then I'm going to explain it. And the answer, the way that I understand it, is yes, you can. And let me explain. And let me explain why. So let's say somebody came through a test of uh, that they had to. Their test was is that they had to be poor in this world. And they go and they're they're thinking about it. They're like, you know what, you know, like I'm here for a reason. I'm, I'm you know, I don't have the money. So what am I need to do? And they start working on themselves and they start fixing themselves. And really, the reason why they needed to be poor was that they needed to fix humility. They had to work on humility. And that, you know, they go together. So that's why God made them poor. And then maybe that's why they wanted to be poor. So they go and they work on every aspect and they start working on humility as well. And now what happens is that they fix humility when all of a sudden when they fix the sin that they had, so all of a sudden the need to be poor is no longer necessary. So then you could be rich also. You could go and, and you know, get whatever it is, you know, plug it into whatever your own personal test is. You have people even that were, to the extent that, if I'm not mistaken, that Rizal brings us down in uh, Shal Gilgulim, that if somebody was came down into this world with not intending to get married, not, which means that he came down without a spouse. Everybody comes down and their soul is split in half. So they have um, half goes to the male, half goes to the female, and then when they get married, they, they unite that, that one part of the soul. So each one has a half a part. There are some people, says that result, that they come down into this world that they don't have the other half coming down. Because that is a test that they, have to, to, that they have to go. They have to go through this world without getting married. But, says the Kab, the Kabbalists teach us, that if somebody goes and works on themselves, and they go and they fix themselves, then it's even possible that God will send you know, this, the, you know, this soul down, and then they will get married. And they say something very interesting. It says that's why sometimes you see a large age gap between spouses. Sometimes that's the reason. Don't look, please don't look at everybody has a large age and be like, you know what, you weren't really even supposed to be here earlier. Like this person, you know, did out Chuvah. And that's, we don't know the full picture, but that's the Kabbalist tells us that could be one of the reasons why you see such a large age, age gap. So you could, and even to the extent that when people pray for something and it's not for their best, if they go and they pray in a certain way and they do the Chuvah in a certain way, that could become the best. So we have so much power in our hands through tshuva, prayer, and doing good deeds that we have the ability to change so much, so much through this. Okay. Oh, I have to see where I'm up to here with the questions. Um, I may have skipped some questions over here, and I apologize. Um, oh, that was the same question. Okay, I think we got it. Any other questions on, on the... I think I got everything. If there's no other questions, then we'll finish. Oh, yeah. No? We have another question here. Um, hold on a second. From the galaxy. Oh, I guess not. No, no other questions. All right. Thank you all for joining. Thank you to the Lighthouse. Thank you for Bejuro. Thank you for the, all the organizations that were involved in this Torah. Anytime. Bezat Hashem. Next week. Same time. Thank you all.